Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, it, I know it's getting later in the day, but the next 50 minutes I hope you're going to find incredibly riveting. We're going to be talking about blockchain. Uh, blockchain as legal technology. Jameson, would you mind closing the doors? Yeah, thank you. So my name is Tony Lai, and I'm the co-founder of Legal.io. Uh, we're a team of lawyers, designers, and engineers creating technology to scale legal services worldwide. Uh, we work with law firms, legal professional uh, regulators, and legal service nonprofits to support their members in building practices that take advantage of the latest developments in legal service innovation and AI-assisted referral management and outcome tracking. Um, I practiced technology, media, and telecoms law for several years. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Stanford Law Science and Technology Master's program here, and I've been a Codex Fellow since 2011, and it's been an absolute honor. With Codex Fellow Kush Srivastava, who sadly can't be here today due to an emergency room visit, uh, our best wishes to him for a speedy recovery. Um, I organize the blockchain group here at Codex, and I'm delighted to be here with two of our members today. Natana Sharma is a partner at Crypto Lotus, a cryptocurrency and blockchain technology fund. She's also faculty in law, policy, ethics, and blockchain at Singularity University, where she writes and speaks on the impact of accelerating technologies and the future of law and governance. To audiences of technologists and business leaders and lawyers, and uh, Natana was previously a tech transactions lawyer as well at Gunderson Detmer. She's a JD MBA graduate from Yale, and she also actively advises on a range of absurdly epic blockchain companies. Dr. Ryan Pip uh, is a real lawyer. Uh, unlike Natana and I, she's a barrister who appears in court and gets in trouble with judges. She's also a lecturer and faculty of law at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, Dr. Ryan's areas of expertise uh, include commercial equity and in particular the liability of third parties to breach of trust. Her PhD formulated a new classification of third parties to breaches of trust. And her current research explores breach of fiduciary duty and apparently trustless commercial relationships. We'll go into that notion of trustlessness later. Uh, and in particular around self-executing contracts, uh, usually enabled by blockchain technologies. PIP designed and coordinates two of uh, UTS's new legal futures subjects, uh, disruptive technologies in the law and law technology policy and ethics. She's chair of the Standards Australia Blockchain Technology Committee's Smart Contracts Working Group, deputy chair of the Australian Computer Society's Blockchain Technical Committee, and she has also co-authored a forthcoming book, Blockchain, Transforming Your Business and Our World. And she's also working on her next title, Trust and Distrust in Distributed and Digital Economies. So here's a quick overview of how we're going to spend the next 45 minutes we've got now. Natana's going to give us a quick blockchain 101. Uh, we'll look at some of the use cases and the issues that legal teams are being asked to consider um, as part of this new and exciting space. I'll share a little further information about our Codex blockchain group, and we'll save some time for questions at the end. Uh, we'll also touch on some concepts around decentralization, uh, which Peter picked up on earlier, that are driving much of the excitement in this space. Um, so maybe I'll just touch on that very briefly uh, before jumping into the 101. Decentralization, what is it and why is it important? So where the early internet was defined by notions of open protocols, intellectual commons, and these set the sort of framework for this decentralized information exchange. Of late, we've seen the rise of more closed architectures. I mean, we started off with these wall gardens, we went into the World Wide Web, and now we've got Facebook, Twitter, app ecosystems that are, in a sense, more tightly controlled, and they're sort of governed by these proprietary databases and sort of data privacy frameworks that are potentially less ideal to, uh, idealized as, as the open internet was. Now, blockchain technology is about programming these new decentralized systems, not just of information exchange, but of, of value exchange. And they've notionally promised this path back to an open protocol era. Now, a lot of people probably know blockchain through Bitcoin. Uh, blockchain is the technology behind Bitcoin. It's become very fashionable to say this. But blockchain systems are, are a combination of a few different technologies, and they are fundamentally about this notion of decentralization. And, and it's not a single thing. Decentralization is a range. On one end, you've got centralized systems where you have this concentrated control around data, around uh, governance uh, within a single entity. And the other end is really undefined. Bitcoin's design 
redefine this notion of what the maximum level of decentralization can be for a system, to allow trust to emerge between systems or entities that really don't have any basis for trust w amongst each other. And some of the ways in which that works, uh, Natana is going to go into. But suffice to say for this moment that creating and ensuring trust between counterparties, that's traditionally been the role of legal systems, of laws, of regulations, contracts, terms of service. These are all designed to lower counterparty risk. So how is blockchain now fulfilling this role as a legal technology? With all that in mind, allow me to hand over to Natana. She's going to start from this number. Great. So um, thanks, everyone. It's, it's great to be here today. Um, and uh, Tony mentioned this a little bit, but just to set the context of, of our talk, I think when people think blockchain, they often think Bitcoin or here in San Francisco, maybe Ethereum or some other pet token of the more than 1,500 that are out there. And um, we're really not going to focus on that today. And so this, this number here is the number that Gartner Research predicts will be the business value generated by blockchain technology by 2030. And that's business value generated by blockchain technology taking cryptocurrencies, or as I prefer to call them, digital assets, totally aside. And that number is now, here in, in 2018, if we're extremely generous, maybe 100 billion. Um, so there's a room for a lot of growth, and that's part of why we're talking about this right now. And I think that's part of why this technology is hyped beyond just crazy price swings in the digital assets markets. So let's talk about how this technology actually works. Um, and to do that, I, want, I do want to set the stage and do some level setting and some framing, um, because we're not going to walk out of here with a deep mathematical understanding of cryptography, but what I'm hopeful we'll walk out with is a conceptual understanding. And to, to kind of give us an, an analogy, you know, who here has sent an email today? I'm pretty sure it's everyone in the room. And who understands the TCP IP protocol that really undergirds the mathematics behind how your email, actu how your email packet actually got from one server to another? I'm guessing it's a far fewer number of hands. Um, blockchain technology, you can think of it as the protocols that will replace our internet of today. So I, I really think um, we're in maybe the 1970s when it comes to the development of this technology as opposed to in 1999. We don't have yet great user experience. We don't have standardized protocols the way um, Linux and uh, Microsoft Windows were later developed. And when you first, when email was first developed to send an email, you had to open up the command line and actually program your email going from one place to another. So we're more at that state when it comes to blockchain technology. Um, but let's dive into how it works. Um, great. So um, what, if, you, if you walk away with one thing and one sound bite that will put you ahead of 99% of people out there on what blockchain technology is, this is it. Um, what blockchain technology can do is it can give a digital object a unique fingerprint. So if you think about a physical object, like this water bottle, um, I can drink from it, I can hand it to Tony, but Tony and I, it'd be pretty tough for us to drink from the same water bottle at the same time. Um, with digital objects, up until the development of blockchain technology in 2009, it was, there, there was this open, unsolved mathematical problem, and that was the problem of how could you reliably, 100% of the time, tell if a digital object is copied, right? So if I take the ones and zeros of a, one digital object and I copy them, how do I know which one was how do I know which one is which, and how do I stop people from giving the same digital dollar to two people? And this is a problem that we right now pay Visa and banks a whole lot of money to solve, and they're not doing a great job. And we'll talk more about that later, just because our, our digital systems right now are very, very easy to hack. Um, but if, if we move on, I'm going to give you another analogy. Um, so who here has used Excel? We don't have a lot of business students in the room, so it may not be everybody. Um, but when you use Excel or you try, to, you try to keep a standard system, a standard system of record, how do you really know which is the right one? Or for, you know, for when, we, when we're lawyers and we deal with documents, how do you do document control and really know which is the final document that you want to have signed? We've got our systems in place, but it's not perfect. You think about moving from kind of emailing documents back and forth to different people, you try to establish your system of record to something like Google Sheets. Google Sheets is more distributed. But with Google Sheets, what you can do is, if we can move to the next slide, um, you can delete your edit history. So this is kind of a tab where it shows, look, you can go to your history in recent tabs, you can go and you can delete the edit history. Um, and when it comes to blockchain technology, you can think of it like a distributed database, like a Google Sheets that gets updated for all of us in real time, but you can't delete the edit history. And I can't underestimate just how or underemphasize how crucial of a difference that is moving from a world where, if you think about um, oral history, right? Uh, it was pretty easy to change memes by coming up with a more clever way to say something. 
And then you move to a world where we have writing. Um, but we're, we all understand that term that the victors get to write history. When, with, with, with written organizations and written forms, and for those people who, you know, I'm not a real lawyer, I don't spend a lot of time in courtrooms. Um, I mean, I'm a member of the bar, so we, we can argue about what that means, but, um, you know, I, I, my understanding is, in, in, you know, in cases, a lot of it can come down to he, he said, she said, or which version of the will was really signed, or which version of this document was really signed. And with blockchain technology, we can get a whole new set of answers to that question. Um, so basically, the way that we want to think about this is we've got a revolution in the way that we share and store information, moving from written, you know, and, and one of the other terms that people have for blockchain technology is uh, calling it triple entry bookkeeping, right? So we've, we're going from single entry to double entry bookkeeping, you already get much better results. It's much easier to audit. Think about the auditor's dream of triple entry bookkeeping or blockchain technology, a database where you can't erase the edit history. Um, so now I want to give you a little bit more of a sense of how this works. Um, so if we, if we go back to the analogy again of, of our Excel spreadsheets, so with the centralized version of the system, Tony and Philippa and I would, up here would be the ones managing the system of record. We move to a blockchain-based system, every single one of you could be a node in the system. You could have your own copy of the information. It's pretty radical, but we have a key problem. Um, and this is the key problem that was really, really difficult to solve when it, mathematically, and that was only solved in 2009. And that problem is, if we've all got a copy, how do we get our copies updated in the same way, at the same time, across all of our nodes, right? How do we do that? And that's this question of how does the network achieve consensus? And this, this is one of the key, key questions, and again, mathematically speaking, we couldn't solve it before the development of Bitcoin. Now the answer I'm giving to you here is a bit of a black box. I'm saying cryptography. Why am I saying cryptography? You know, who here has heard about Bitcoin being slow, Bitcoin using a lot of energy, um, all these problems with Bitcoin. This is true of Ethereum as well. Bitcoin and Ethereum use something called proof of work to update their networks. We can go into that in the Q&A, but I'm not going into that for you here because I actually consider that the old version of the technology that will be replaced. And so in the intervening years since the development of Bitcoin, um, engineers, computer science, scientists, and cryptographers have really been working on new ways of updating the network reliably, 100% reliably, such that you lose no bits at the same time in the same way across nodes. And that's what we're really looking for. Um, and I think um, if you focus too much on the problems with Bitcoin, you're going to miss all of the incredible development that's happening today on new kinds of cryptography that can update the network faster and more seamlessly. But once we've got our network updated, what basically what happens is each of us nodes will add a new block of transactions to our blockchain. So you can think about it like a new cell in our, each of our Excel spreadsheets is updated in the same way at the same time across nodes. And um, who here has heard about blockchain being secure? This, I'm gonna share with you what that security means because blockchain's not perfect, it's not a panacea, but what, what it is is it's incredibly sensitive to changes. So each block is cryptographically connected, and which, what that means is that if you change one character in a block, so you change a period to a comma, you make any changes, it will be timestamped that the change was made and there will be some record of the key of who made that change. It might just be a public key, we can get into some details of what that might look like, but the thing to take away is if you make a change in a blockchain database, everyone's gonna know when that change was made and who made it. Um, and if you, let's say you do want to try to make a change and have no one know, right? Because, I mean, the way that you cheat systems is you make changes and have no one know that the changes were made. Um, if you want to do that in a blockchain database, you have to make that change on over 50% of the nodes at the same time, in the same way, and not just on one cell, but you have to make it on every single block in the whole history of the blockchain at the same time. That's very, very difficult to do computationally. And so you have a radical new level of security when it comes to the database itself. What you don't have is a perfect means of actually putting information into that database. And so you can cheat a blockchain system by, che by cheating the points of entry where data gets entered into the database. Our database still need needs to meet the rubber of the reality road. Um, but once the information is there, it's very hard to change it without anyone knowing, without everyone knowing that it's been changed, when it's been changed, how it's been changed. And so before we dive into some examples, which we're about to do, I kind of, I want to share um, one last bit of technological exegesis, as it were, 
Um, and that is a, an overview of what smart contracts are. And I, I think the term smart contract, like many terms in the space, like terms like cryptocurrency, um, are misnomers. And so if you hear the word smart contract and you think anything like what we do every day when we, we write uh, legal contracts as in technology transactions or anywhere else we've got our legal contracts, you're, 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 you've gone many t steps too far. Um, what a smart contract actually is is just any piece of executable code. Um, so who here has ever had a, a co computer application subscription that has automatic renewal? Amazon, Spotify, pretty much all of us. And you know, who's used automatic bill payment? Um, congratulations, you guys have used smart contracts. So smart contracts are actually nothing new. Um, and what's new is being able to couple smart contracts with a blockchain. So when you take a database and you, you have a database that doesn't lose bits, that de that's decentralized, and you can operate smart contracts on top of that decentralized database, all of a sudden there's a whole new range of applications that are possible. That's what we're gonna talk about when it comes to the examples. But uh, I'm gonna give uh, Tony and, and Pip here opportunities to weigh in on the uh, technology itself. Well, as you say, as, as, thank you so much, Natana. I, I think we uh, <laughs> I know I spoke very fast, but we don't have a lot of time. I was trying to cover a lot of ground. Um, well, it's, I mean, I think for our audience here, one of the interesting pieces is how smart contracts relate to this notion of the rubber of reality hitting the road. Um, and Pip, this is, this is something that you've looked a lot into, um, smart contracts and their relationship with the existing law. So maybe you could lay out some of the frameworks that you've been thinking through. Can I, can I use a right of reply first, please? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what that is. You, you, will, you will, Natana, <laughs> you will. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say, Natana suggested that the person whose version of the story is believed is the person who wins in court, but in, in my practice in equity, the person who wins is the better liar which is just a nuanced way of saying exactly what you said. But in equity, basically, you're talking about the failure to produce a document to prove the relationship or the arrangement. And so it's a very powerful thing to be the better liar. I have tried to say to my clients, if you're crying, they know you're lying. And I can't tell you how many of my clients have first of all started by lying to me, and then they lie to the judge. And yes, tears ensue, not mine, theirs. <laughs> Um, so in relation to the, the term smart contract, um, I'm working on the International Standards Organization's Blockchain Technical Committee. I'm the lead author for the technical specification for smart contracts. We've got a four-year project, but we will be producing iterative reports every six months, and the first one will be tabled in May this year in London. And we debated, I would say, for half a day. It was like the United Nations debating whether or not to invade a rogue state as to whether we should use the term smart contract <laughs> when we talk about blockchain-based programmable applications. And we all decided to disagree <laughs> that the best term was probably just smart contract. So we are stuck with it for now. Because I think whatever, what we did understand was that everybody had a sense of what that was. Smart meaning that, smart meaning that it could be automated and contract just meaning the automation of maybe just a part of a transaction on a contract. Think of that as a little C contract and we'll talk about as lawyers, big C contracts are gonna be the ones where you're actually talking about does it meet the legal terms that we learned when we did contract 101 at law school. And I do the same thing with trust. Little C trust is all about feeling a safe sense of the relationship with the person you're dealing with. Big T trust is more like express trusts or implied trusts. Um, and then another way just to think about, you know, Natana was saying what's new now about smart contracts. Yes, I, totally, that's what's new now. This idea about the programmable application being interoperable with the blockchain, with blockchain technology. What's going to be even newer is when these smart contracts have baked into them complex conditional logic and they will start automating the go button on whether to actually transact. And then even further down the track, we as humans are gonna to start to allow data collected and analyzed by AI to determine whether a certain condition has been satisfied that will then automate the smart contract. And that's where chaos kicks in, and that's why it's important that we are all in this room together as lawyers, and that we're talking about it in this little sweet spot that we have right now, where we can talk about what does that mean moving forward. 
So what does ISO do? Our job is three things. Number one, improve the reputation of blockchain. Number two, make sure that nobody in the market dominates and wins, unless by default there's already something good out there that's working. Excel spreadsheets are a very good example of that. We all loved and had a special place in our hearts for Lotus 1, 2, 3, but gone, 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 and replaced with Excel, which just dominated and was good enough, and it has by default become the standard spreadsheet protocol that we'll use. So the question is who's gonna win in the blockchain war? We're hoping not one player who will then re-centralize what we're trying to decentralize. And that's been a problem with the internet since its inception. So just to quickly talk about this interoperability between smart contracts and the law and, and the way that I'm situating it with the work that I do um, with ISO and also as an academic and as a, as a lecturer. Um, I think there's just six really, really interesting conditions to think about. I'm gonna just bolt through them because we're lawyers and these aren't new to any of us, but just this, this, can, this situates the way that we need to think about smart contracts when we talk about interoperability with the law. Because ISO is very keen to make sure, so International Standards Organization, ISO, is very keen to ensure that when it does consider standards, and it doesn't make laws, but when it considers standards, it considers their interoperability, the interoperability of technology with incumbent systems or new systems, and that includes the law. So what we do as lawyers is we codify human relationships, obligations, rights, and proscriptions, and what blockchain does is it can codify relationships and arrangements. So what do we do? How do we drill into that? The six, the six conditions, and if you want to quote these, you can call them PIPs conditions, but there's no patent out there. I'm just putting it on the record now. Uh, number one, we need to think about the contract, the smart contract, and whether it gives rise to the transfer of value or just information, or is there both, or is there one for the other? Is there consideration for a promise? Is consideration moving from the promisee if all of those conditions are met, we probably have a legal contract in that smart contract. But you might only have one or two of those. You may even have just a remittance, just the, the transaction of money pursuant to an existing and well-expressed well off-chain arrangement that is in fact the agreement or the contract. Number two, trust law. Do we have agency? Do we have custodial obligations? Don't anybody ask a question about that in the Q&A or we'll be here till midnight. You've been warned. Ask me after a couple of drinks and I'll give you the hilarious version. <laughs> Three, privacy law. Now, this is going to go off. 20 years ago, privacy did not even exist as a subject anywhere. 300 years ago, nobody had privacy. Privacy is a modern phenomenon. It's a part of globalization. It's a part of industrialization. Privacy has gone again. And so it's just a blip in history. We will all look back on it with great affection, those of us old enough to remember it, but it's gone. So the question is, what do we do about personal information that's gathered by organizations, including sensitive personal information? So that's privacy. Number four, cybersecurity rules. Who's hacking? The interesting thing about hacking, and yes, I have a PhD in accessorial liability, Interesting thing about hacking is it's not the hackers who get done by the system, it's those who are responsible for securing the information and that's why cybersecurity is big business. Number five, international treaties in relation to KYC, so that's know your customer or your client, also know your client's client, look at the English legislation that was passed last year. Anybody operating in England will have shivers going down their spine because lawyers, bankers and advisors can be liable for tax evasion. Once again, where's the, where's the primary wrongdoer as opposed to the agent, the advisor, the accessorial um, uh, agent? Uh, Anti-money laundering rules and counter-terrorism financing. So that was number five. Number six, and this is the last one, legislation and conventions for example, about the capacity to contract or should actually the smart contract express itself in writing in order for what it did to actually be valid because there are certain conventions around things having to be in writing. And finally, what about the validity and enforceability of the contract and was a digital signature enough? So when we think about those six, why, why do I care and what does it have to do with everything else? Well, the work we've done over the last year in ISO is trying to aggregate the laws of 20 different jurisdictions. And I think we did a really amazing job. A report was tabled in November in Tokyo in, at our second conference. And so that's the work. That's the work for everybody in this room who wants to think about blockchain as something that's cross-jurisdictional, but at the same time that doesn't oust the jurisdiction of the court.
Pip, that was, that was incredible. Thank you. Um, so, so to, glad. To, for, for putting us some of that in context, uh, I want to just shift through to some examples now. And I think one of the things I promised was that we'd look at some of these legal issues in that context. And so um, the first one, um, I think, Pip, you, were, you had some um, particular... Uh, insights on this, but Natana, maybe you can just give us a quick headline on this particular example first. Sure. So I'm going to kind of share um, what's what's happening now um, with this example, and then um, Pip is going to share some work that she's currently doing that's very related. Um, so Maersk is one of the largest companies in the world. It's a private company, and um, it isn't. It accounts for shipping about 70 million shipping containers a year. And Maersk and IBM uh, last July did a successful pilot putting the documentation and administration of um, moving bills of lading through ports uh, onto a blockchain-based system. And uh, they then, by the end of the year, put about 10 million of their 70 million shipping containers onto the system. And they're going full speed ahead, totally transforming their shipping. Um, and also, Maersk and IBM in January have started a new joint venture, a new company that's going to be offering this as a service to all kinds of international shippers. And um, they're partnering with some of the largest logistics companies in the world. And international shipping accounts for about $1.8 trillion of our 75 or so trillion dollar global economy. And um, about five to seven trillion dollars worth of goods move through the seas. And one of the things that's really striking is the, the pilot. I'm going to share with you what the pilot was. So um, the, they took a shipment of avocados from Mombasa in Kenya that were going to Rotterdam. And at each step along the way in the old system, you'd actually have to have papers stamped by the right people at each port. Um, and that took a lot of time. But the, you know, the, the folks at Maersk, um, they've actually put about $400 million worth of investment into building the system. And they're not stupid. They have a lot of money. Um, there's a reason why they did not automate their system until now, right? So you were only able to put smart contracts on the blockchain reliably and regularly since 2015 with the development of Ethereum. So this, this whole field is brand, brand new. And it lets you enter into, um, it lets you automate processes and systems where it really matters if they get hacked. Because you know what, if, if I am a, an, an examiner of a container and I say it has avocados in it, but it's actually got some white powder that's not avocados, um, it matters, it matters what I stamp it and, and what I say. And in a system that's extremely easy to hack, um, no one on any side is comfortable with, with putting their, their rights around which goods are moving from country to country onto um, an automated system. And so with, within an organization, you can have all kinds of automation around bills of lading. But what's important here is it's really how information moves from singular party to singular party when those parties are go different governments and companies that don't have much reason to trust each other. And one final thing I'll say before um, turning things over to, to Pip is that um, I think, you know, we're, I, I think we want to start just really thinking about what's possible with these decentralized systems differently um, and what we can automate and how we can automate and how that's different when you can reliably know if a particular person has actually signed for something and um, you can know when and how the transaction record changes at each step along the way. Uh, okay, so the, the particular supply chain project that we're working on at the University of Technology in conjunction with a like a joint venture partner that's not a university, but we, we did get some um, government funding for this, is to explore using a blockchain supply chain and a series of smart contracts to track agricultural products, in particular dairy and wine. They're products that are very close to um, the heart of most Australians because they're really valuable export products. And the market for fake made in Australia labels with those products is a whole business in itself and it degrades everybody on the system. It degrades the, the provider, the producer of that fantastic product. It degrades the supply chain along the way because people are paying too much for something that's fake. And then it also degrades everything for the consumer. And what we're trying to do is attach to this process everything Natana's just described. So I won't go through exactly what you would track along the way but you can add nodes, for example, to a refrigerated system that can detect and report back to the blockchain via smart contracts the temperatures to make sure that the tolerances for exactly how, what temperature the dairy should be stored at and the wine 
are maintained. And if that fails for some reason, you can have built into this via a further smart contract automated insurance that pays out on failure. The policy becomes cheaper, the payout happens faster. Yes, you may have disputes in relation to that, but you can also set up automated arbitration on the same system. Now, I know there's a lot of the privatisation of the law and this philosophical contention there, and I'm actually one of the people who philosophically don't like private arbitration. I think it, I think it erodes the common law, but I'm also a realist, and I wouldn't sue anyone if it was for less than 20,000 Australian, and I wouldn't go to the Supreme Court and have me appear for if it was less than 100,000. <laughs> so once you know those tolerances for litigation, and let's all face it, litigation is the seventh circle of hell, <laughs> but, but fun if you're the barrister, um, you know, the, the uncertainty and the chaos that happens. And it was interesting, somebody was talking today about judicial decision making and trying to automate the outcomes. Oh my God, the reverse engineering that happens in court. I can't tell you how many times judges have looked at me and said, Ms. Ryan, I've worked out your client's a liar, so she loses, no matter what the law would have dictated if everything else had been equal. And once they've made that decision, they will reverse engineer the legal processes we learnt in law school to make sure the outcome is against your client. And I actually had a client who had that said of her once, and when we walked out, she said, that might have gone better if I hadn't lied to you quite so much. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll be pleased to hear, I made a file note of that conversation immediately. I'm just like, I'll just stop and record that. Um, so I think it's really important to appreciate that the, we're plugging into this, the potential to solve a number of economic, business and legal issues while also then just enabling a little bit of clarity and trust to be built into systems and into, let's just say, real physical products that are really subject to hacking. Um, and that's in addition to all of the bleeds and leaking that happens with financial systems that exist in the incumbent um, models, you know, with, with mini fraud, mini, mini mistakes and mini loss on exchange rates, millions of dollars every year could all be plugged with blockchain technology. So the, the possibilities are huge. So I'm going to skip over this next use case. We were running a bit short on time, but I'm going to just take a step back. Um, having dived into a specific use case there and a specific set of use cases, that um, one of the things that we wanted to just cover is just some sort of broader sets of opportunities that we're seeing in the market at the moment. Um, and again, it's uh, a lot of business and technical teams that are coming up with these various uh, approaches. Um, but at the same time, there are some incredible legal issues and legal opportunities as well. So I'm going to touch on four that we've picked out. And uh, the first is around documenting identity and property. Um, so um, I know, Pip, this is very close to your heart as well, but um, Natana, maybe you could kick us off on this. So I'll, I'll say something uh, a little more general and then let Pip dive in. But right now, we're living in a world where um, there are over 100,000 refugees with no identities through no fault of their own. Um, we also are living in a world where, you know, does anyone here remember the Equifax hack that happened over the summer? So pretty much every American, um, over 100 million American identities were hacked, and that's your social security number, your credit history, everything. And um, it's entire, given the tools that hackers have in our 21st century, it's just entirely antiquated to use a nine-digit number to secure citizens' identities. And so um, to document identity better, that's an incredible use case and opportunity for blockchain. Relatedly, documenting property is a very powerful use case. So has anyone here bought a house and gotten title insurance? Um, right? I mean, so in, t in the developing world to make sure, or in the, in, we're lucky enough to be in um, the United States or you know, if we're coming from other countries, most likely countries in the developed world where we can be reasonably sure of our titles. Even so, we still get title insurance because if there's a problem with the title, you can lose your house through no fault of your own. In much of the developing world, property rights are much less secure. So if you look at Central, um, South, South America, up to 70% of rural property rights can be insecure. And what that means is that if the wrong person becomes mayor, they don't like you and they like your friend, they can go into the courthouse, change the records, and you have very little recourse. And so um, opportunities to put documentation, documentations and systems around property identification on blockchain are very powerful. Um, okay, so just to correct you ever so gently, N oh, Anatana, please. no, just... Um, <laughs> I can see why the I judges don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. I, okay, so I told these guys the worst anecdote where a judge said to me a couple of years ago, Ms. Ryan, you're very smart and you know what you're talking about, but I don't like your tone. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and another one said, um, Ms Ryan, one of the problems with being a junior barrister is sometimes you have to appear before stupid judges. And it took me a second, but I then said, Your Honour, can I suggest that in this scenario you don't think you're the stupid one? Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I asked if it was too late for a, um, an apology. He said, yes, it's too late. You like, just leave the courtroom. Um, so I just wanted to say about the Equifax hack. Um, Natana referred to that as having occurred last summer. This is why I work with standards. No, it occurred last winter. But... <laughs> OK. <laughs> you're, a lot this is of why I'm a recovering attorney. Morning. Yeah, you're going to work it out. At about two in the morning, you'll go, I got that. OK. Um, so... <laughs> Um, this title insurance question is very interesting in relation to property because in Australia you don't need title insurance. We have title assurance which comes through indefeasibility. Whatever it says on the title is final and you cannot rock that boat. It's called the Torrens system. Robert Torrens was an Irish economist. He introduced it into the Australian title system in the 1830s. It's used all over Australia. Whatever it says on the title is final. You do not own property because you bought it you own the property because you're the registered you're registered on the title as the owner and um, so the powerful thing about that is it's just like blockchain robert torrens borrowed that from shipping shipping titles in the 17th and 18th century one sheet of paper above the line describe the ship or in our case describe the title who owns it and then underneath it all of the charges against it mortgages caveats any any registrable interests mining interests so, indefeasibility means when you buy property in Australia, you don't need to do, do, do any due diligence on the history of the title that you're about to acquire because it is indefeasible, and that's just like blockchain. You, I love the idea that as each block is, is closed off and you've got this cryptographic proof of work, that you have certainty about everything that came before. In relation to identity, I think that's the weak link for blockchain, but there's a lot of very, very smart people working on solving that. The proof of work is very powerful on the objective qualities, that is, the work that has been done. It's quite weak when it comes to the subjective, which is who did the work. So that, that's all I wanted to say about identity and property. Fantastic. And I just um, want to pick up on the identity point, just this uh, point that we picked up at the MIT Legal Forum around GDPR yes. and all of that that's coming in. So um, could you say a little bit, uh, and we won't go too deep into this because we could go again forever, but it's, uh, there's some interesting, obviously, compliance uh, frameworks that are being put in place right now, um, but there's also some interesting affordances or opportunities around things like the subject access requests that um, could be brought in as a result of some of these uh, different ways of looking at identity, different ways that individuals might be in control of their own data in different ways? Um, yes, yeah, so there are, there are some, there's some amazing work that we saw actually demoed at MIT last November. And um, I think what will happen in the future is that there are going to be apps sitting on our phones connected to our own data, and we will be able to send the push notifications ourselves by just clicking checkboxes to whomever of our trusted institutions actually has done, for example, the KYC or has stored our medical data. I, d I know that it's pretty much the law everywhere, but in Australia, you do not own your medical data. It's the creator of the medical record who owns it. And my bank owns my KYC and controls it. But the future of open banking and open medical on blockchain will be, it'll remain secure, but the person who's the originator or who needs to rely on it will be able to send the push. A couple of weak little points that we raised last year, which are just things like, how do you then manage enduring power of attorney and estates? I, do, I really love the idea of my, the privacy of my financial and my health records, but on death, I'd like my, my medical records to remain private and a bunch of other stuff, which I won't share, but <laughs> the financials, I want those advertised because as Milton Friedman said in 1998, the average man or woman, in Natana's in my case, we're accumulating wealth for the next generation. M that's what most people are doing, and I want it known. I want it found, I want it disclosed. So you've suddenly got to do a, a reveal upon your death, and now somebody's got to decide how that works. So there are issues, but there are, there's very good work being done where trust mechanisms are going to be managed by trusted institutions that will then also plug into those systems, and it could be your law firm, your lawyer. Um, there's work to be done by lawyers that's going to be built into this, um, the AI will just play along with it. As the boring work we used to do, we won't have to do anymore. We'll get to do the fun stuff like this. So the second one we've kind of uh, touched on a little bit in the context of 
the wine and, and the provenance, but this is a specific picture that, Natana, you, you, you put up. What is this a picture of? Uh, so this is a picture of a policeman in China, and he's standing on top of um, actually tons of seized fake medicines. And the reason that this is so powerful is because if, if you can just imagine going into a store and grabbing some Tylenol and not really knowing if it will actually work, or even more important medicines with active ingredients and not knowing if they're really there in the quantity you need. And that's a, a real problem for many people throughout our, our world. Um, and for all the problems with the FDA, we're, we're shielded to some degree from this problem here in America, but there are tons and tons of fake medicines seized around the world every day. And so using blockchain technology to develop provenance for goods and and services and making sure that when you go into a store and you buy something, you actually are getting what you think you're getting. It's a key use case. And I will flag there's a project called, you know, for here in the United States, we've got um, drug safety compliance rules around um, drug pharmaceutical companies having to track um, uh, medicines through the system. And it's very difficult for pharmaceutical companies to comply. It's very expensive. And so there are projects from large pharmaceutical companies, including a project called MetaLedger that's coming from, um, it's coming from Pfizer, Mer uh, Merck, a couple of other large players that's working on um, developing a blockchain-based system for actually compliance with drug safety rules here in the US. So from a regulator perspective, um, being able to look and see these regulatory technology solutions coming over the, the horizon, this can and should be playing into the ways that they're actually formulating policy and regulations, potentially. Yeah, I think, um, see, the GDPR scares all Australians because we don't have a general right of privacy in Australia. It just doesn't exist. We have legislation that says organisations must manage your private information in certain ways if they gather data, particularly personal information. But I think once we think about... The reason why we're so scared of the GDPR worldwide, and everybody should be very nervous about it, is the massive penalties that are going to be incurred, not by the hacker, but by the party that should have been protecting the data from hacking. With blockchain, I think we're going to be able to see more security in relation to that very sensitive information in a way that is going to prevent the risk from arising and then the insurance prices come down and, and then you're basically you're opening up access to insurance for this to smaller players and also then for vulnerable populations, which should be part of our part of our discussion, which is why I love Natana mentioning about the fake drugs, because we need to make sure vulnerable populations are protected and that technology is reaching out for that purpose. The, the other thing I'll say about the GDPR is that there are folks um, that are working on trying to develop blockchain-based compliance for GDPR. I think the challenge is that one of the key pieces of European privacy law is the right to be forgotten. And it's unclear to me, um, I mean, th there are potential technical solutions around that to some degree because there's something called a zero knowledge proof, which is a way of shielding. You can prove that a thing happened and you can prove certain details about it while shielding the participants and shielding details about the transaction. That said, um, depending on how the right to be forgotten ends up being interpreted by courts in connection with blockchain, you could have some problems in actually ever ever complying with the right to be forgotten. And some of these questions we're not going to know the answers to until case law um, hits courts. And unfortunately, as we all know, um, bad cases often make bad law, particularly in, in new innovative areas of technology. So a third big potential use case, fraud, $3.5 trillion. It's a large number. So I think um, here we want to think about the other side of the transaction. So one side of the transaction is, hey, when I go to a store, how do I know I'm getting what I think I'm getting? And then on the merchant side, the question is, how do I know I'm actually getting paid? Um, chargebacks are huge issues. There's all kinds of fraud that permeate our system. Um, you know, I think uh, it, in, in the global economy in 2016, I don't remember the exact number. Something like $74 trillion is one of the best estimates I could find. Um, Fraud is a huge dead weight on our global economy, and it's, I think, one, this is, again, you know, when we go back to why is blockchain so hyped and why do people treat it like a silver bullet, it's because our, our institutions and our global systems are, are really um, uh, challenged by the weight of the problems that they're facing, and our, ordinary, our, our systems haven't been developed to deal with our digital age. And so um, I think people are hyping blockchain because it provides a glimmer of hope, even if it's not a panacea or silver bullet. Yeah, I, I spot on exactly what, what you just said about this whole idea of us not really being prepared with systems to manage this digital age. 
I actually think that's at the heart of why it's hyped. A lot of people just go, well, why are we interested now in smart contracts? When, as you said, Natana, you said they've existed for ages. We've had these automated transactions and contracts. The reason we're also hot about it right now is because the internet and the way that we are gathering data and the way that we've been managing transactions has created problems that we now need to solve. So the internet gives us opportunity, solves some problems, creates a bunch of problems, and now in this new sort of internet 3.0, I guess, or 4.0, we need blockchain 2.0. We need it to do the next thing it can do. And then it just comes down to seeing what that means for solving some of the weaknesses in, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, so th another weakness, I mean, and here's another big number, but uh, cybercrime as a, as, a, as a broader problem that can be addressed here as well. And so th this is the final area we're going to talk about, but um, this past year, in 2017, cybercrime accounted for maybe $400 billion of, of losses, of costs, um, and Juniper Research Networks and some other figures that I found predict that that number may be $2 trillion or more by 2019. And so we've got this exponential curve going in the wrong direction, and very little, very little great solutions on how we fight this. More and more of our lives are going online. We're automating more and more. Um, you know, I'm, I'm extremely bullish on artificial intelligence and automating products and services. Um, but it is a problem if we have an autonomous car network and that grid gets hacked, or if our energy grids get hacked. And so the more and more that we put online, the more that cybercrime becomes an issue, and the more that there's room for hackers to um, co exert costs on our system. And so I think, um, you know, I, th I think th this is a key, it, we, we, don't have, we don't have much of an option. I think automation adds a tremendous amount of value to our global economy. It enables us to interact with people all around the world and to create together, but it's also got these costs. And I think if we go back to the Maersk example, um, when you see these, these fraud numbers and the cybercrime number, that's part of the reason why Maersk um, wasn't able to automate its systems until now. Um, okay, well, the only thing I really wanted to add about cybercrime really applies to everything, and I've sort of made the point in, in, um, in the prior comments, but I can't stress enough what I think is the big issue for lawyers in the way that we advise our clients moving forward, which is, you know, Natan has just described this terrible cost of cybercrime. It seems to be the only way that governments can see a way to actually make anyone accountable and to bring in any meaningful regulation is to put the obligation on the data gatherers and those who host the actual cyberspace that is being hacked. And so it, understanding that as a lawyer who advises clients who want to use technologies, you have to actually keep stressing, you've got to shore up the systems you're using. And as lawyers, and I say this to my students, we need to demand to look under the hood of the technology that we're going to be using because we owe duties to the court and an ethical obligation to the, to, the, um, to, the, to the profession, but also to the community as upholders of the rule of law, but as also upholders of our profession, that we need to demand to understand what the technology does so that we can defend it in court and so that we can rely on it in a way that, that fulfills our professional obligations, which primarily remain to the court and to the rule of law. And so this, this notion of looking under the hood, um, this speaks to this notion of robust security, but also the open access that is, again, one of these fundamental characteristics that we are thinking about when it comes to decentralization. This notion that anyone can look at the security and the, the idea that this continuous exposure to threats helps with the evolution of a resistance to those threats. I mean, it's a fundamental premise of open source. Um, but these are all, uh, what we've got listed here, they're, they're all part of uh, that sort of set of characteristics can, that can make a system more or less decentralized. Um, what you'll see when we're talking about this broader ecosystem is there are, there are a range of um, approaches to creating a more or less decentralized distributed ledger. And we're gonna see different versions from sort of private to sort of consortium, hybrid based sort of semi-public private to sort of fully public global, borderless, neutral, immutable, censorship resistant, permissionless access-based systems. And so the, the, the limiting factor on going all the way out to that level of decentralization right now is, uh, is the concept of governance, right? Uh, one of the reasons why we want to, uh, there are distributed ledger systems that are sort of more consortium based right now is because trying to make decisions together in a fully decentralized way is very, very difficult still. And that's gonna be one of the big sort of research agendas for a lot of these 
uh, these ecosystems is how they can go about creating those same sense of uh, trusted, legitimate decisions in a fully decentralized system. Um, I'm running a bit short of time, so I'm going to move on from this, but um, please feel free to... We have to move, have to move on. on. Okay. We're ready at time. So. I, I think we started 15 minutes late, so I wasn't sure if we had, we had a little bit of... So I'll, I'll just... I'll wrap it up shortly. So this is the Codex Blockchain Group. This is what we're doing. Um, please feel free to get in touch if you're interested in learning more. Um, one of the really exciting projects we're doing is a new journal of blockchain law and policy. Um, we've already been receiving submissions. Uh, Pip, I think you reviewed the first submission uh, uh, last night, so this is very exciting. Please feel free to get in touch to uh, be a peer reviewer or a sponsor. We, we welcome um, people who want to get involved. And we've got an upcoming workshop that we're doing uh, very much around governance and identity. Uh, and again, please get in touch to find out more about that. Um, so with that, maybe a, a question or two do we have time for? Just really, if people could uh, walk up, if you have a question, then you could ask them in the break. Okay, let's do that. Um, please join me then in a round of applause for our wonderful panel members.